Austin, too. Hi, Bishop. Hi, Ron. Welcome. How are you? <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> yeah. What a treat to be with you again. Here we are in later August, and this will air on the 22nd of August, which is, of course, oh. the Queenship of Mary, so another feast mm -hmm. of Our Lady. Maybe we could just jump in, Ron, because I know you're yeah. chomping at the bit of these questions. Please do. Let's it. just jump in at a few things on calendar, yeah, okay? Yeah. So, uh, in fact, this evening when this will air, I'll be delighted to take part in the 14th year anniversary dinner for Holy Family Radio. And that, of course, is in, it's going to take place in Lima at the Veterans Memorial Civic and Convention Center. And I know Deacon Harold Berksivers is the featured speaker. And you may know him from the, as the dynamic deacon from EWTN. So I'll be thrilled to be able to celebrate these years of Catholic radio in Holy Family Radio. And then let's see, lots of things packing the schedule, but then on Saturday the 24th, I have one of my quarterly meetings with the Diocesan Pastoral Council, and you know those are folks from all over the diocese who represent their deaneries. Our deaneries just shifted, so we went from 15 to 12. And then uh, that it, this is what Monsignor Kabaki, our Vicar General, likes to call folks the trifecta of picnics. So on Saturday evening, we'll host a picnic at the... Uh, garden of the cathedral right next to the rectory of the episcopal residence the pastoral center employees and their families that picnic begins after the vigil mass of the cathedral which is at five so it begins at six on a sunday we have the deacons and their wives picnic in the afternoon and then on monday we have the priests picnic at the residence. It's all under the same tent because it's easier to do it three days in a row, folks, and it's cheaper just to rent the tent once, as you can imagine. And, uh, and on Sunday morning, the 25th, though, I'll be out to be uh, celebrating, please God, the installation of, an, of another pastor. So we'll work, we're working on that schedule right now as we speak. And then let's see what else is going on in the week. It looks like that's going to be pretty much it for the public calendar. But, Ron, you and I know that the public calendar is only one one hundredth of what goes on. So after the trifecta of the picnic right. and all the food yes. and all the uh, shaking hands and talking or whatever and yes. your Sunday commitments, you just sleep for like three days? or No, I think I'll be up at the regular hour, <laughs> 5 a.m. <laughs> all right. Well, let's move to a recent gospel from John. Thank you. From the 20th Sunday in Ordinary it's Time. It's beautiful, the, all these gospels uh, from the Eucharist. Yes. Jesus said to the crowds, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews quarrel among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. Your thoughts, Bishop. Thank you. So, folks, once again, what a grace that uh, this cycle of Gospels from St. John, emphasizing the Holy Eucharist, happens to be right in this period of time as we are continue in the Eucharistic Revival and as we've just had our National Eucharistic Congress. I, I just want to reiterate, I know I talked about it last week, if you were listening last or watching last week, but just to reiterate again how striking it was for me that Jonathan Rumi, who many of you knew, plays Jesus on the series The Chosen, he came out, he was a major speaker Saturday evening, and he actually did this reading in what he jokingly called his Jesus voice. So he did this dramatic reading as he sort of stepped into character right there on stage. And he did this reading for all of us. It was quite, quite striking. I must confess to all of you, though, if you watch it, what was also striking was his T-shirt. And Jonathan Rumi appeared in, he was in completely dressed in white. He had a white 
t-shirt and a white belt and white pants and white shoes. It was really something. One of our young priests said to me, well, he is a movie star, a TV star after all, because somebody commented he had a lot of rings on too. But folks, on his t-shirt, if you saw it, black and white, in the black on his t-shirt, large letters that said, if it's only a symbol, to hell with it. And underneath, F. O'Connor. If you don't know it, that's a quote from Flannery O'Connor. And her work, of course, is so extraordinary as a Catholic writer. But that's one of her famous quotes. If the, it doesn't say the Eucharist, if it's only a symbol, that is, if the Eucharist is only a symbol, then to hell with it. It tells you everything about Flannery O'Connor's Eucharistic faith. And this is the basis of our Eucharistic faith. And the very phrase that we've used for the Eucharistic revival throughout the United States, the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. Not a symbol, a reality. And the reality is that Jesus has given us that bread, the living bread come down from heaven in the body, blood, soul, and divinity which we receive in the Holy Eucharist. So if it's only a symbol, to hell with it. I like to be in the company of Flannery O'Connor. <laughs> Thank you, Bishop. Let's go ahead and get a question in here. Thank and you. Let's start with Connie from Toledo. Thank you, Connie. Says, Dear Bishop, can I disagree with something that the Pope says and still be a good Catholic? If so, what topics are these disagreements limited to? Thanks, Connie. <laughs> there we go. So the simple answer to that is yes, but it needs a little more qualification, Connie. So can you disagree with something he says? If the Pope says that the chair is a table, you can disagree with that. <laughs> if the Pope says that the sky is green, well, sometimes it might be because of the, the but you can disagree with that because the sky is usually blue. So the, the reality is that we can disagree because the Pope is a human person and he's not, you know, if he says something that is objectively, objectively untruthful or wrong, well, sure, we can disagree. Here's where we can't disagree, Connie. When the Pope speaks about faith and morals, because that's who he, he is the symbol and the unity that assures that as Catholics, we can listen to, abide, and follow the teaching of the church, especially when he speaks infallibly. So we follow, of course, we follow the fourth commandment, honor your father and mother, because he's our father in faith. But we also know that when he speaks and he says he's speaking infallibly, then we must listen and we must agree because he's teaching on faith and morals. So again, if the Pope being human, because maybe his eyes, you know, faded because he's getting older, whoever that Pope may be, if the Pope says, well, that, that's an orange and it's actually an apple, you can disagree. But we cannot disagree when he teaches on faith and morals. All right. Thank you. Let's get one more in quick, Bishop. Thank you. Uh, Deanna from Toledo, dear Bishop Thomas, a friend of mine mentioned recently that we as Catholics do the sign of the cross differently than they do. She is Eastern Rite, and after touching the head and chest, they do the sign to the right, then the left, whereas Catholics do the left, then the right. What's the origin for this difference? Thanks, Deanna. Great, and be careful, Deanna. Good for you, Deanna. Thanks for the question. It's a great question. If people have ever seen this, a lot of people from the National Eucharistic Congress told me they saw Eastern Rite Catholics blessing themselves, quote, backwards. So be careful, because you say, right, whereas Catholics do, left to the, oh, careful, because they're Catholic too. So you have to say Latin right Catholics, right? Be very careful, Deanna. So what's the bottom line? And I would say this is a great article. And, you know, I, I often give these sources because why? They're worthy of giving, and I think it's helpful. Ali Teya has an article from 2017. Why do Eastern right Christians make the sign of the cross backwards? So it's a great article. I would go to it. But, in fact, the right to left practice, and if you're watching on video, it would be this. That's the way they make the sign of the cross. It's likely the oldest, Deanna. Isn't that interesting? It's likely older than what Latin Rite Catholics do. It's the gesture by which Christians signify the blessing of their person in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The tradition has prevailed in the West, and it's customary among Latins, as I just mentioned, Latin Rite Catholics, to do it in the opposite direction, which also 
frankly, is this question of like looking in a mirror. And that's one of the reasons, because it said that the most ancient form was this right to left. The ancient form also was, and just to, because I know I'm going to get this question next week, that the three fingers were joined and they were to represent the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the two fingers were placed into the palm, and that represented that Jesus was both God and man. So that's the simple answer, but the Alatea article I would recommend as a really good background. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bishop, we have to take a quick break. We got two questions in, Rob. Yeah, we've still got You're a doing lot. so well, got a lot. Yeah, I early am. I'm so proud of you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm doing really well. Folks, we have to... We'll be right back, and don't go anywhere, because we do have a lot of questions. Stay with us, everyone. Annunciation Radio is your voice for the Diocese of Toledo. Serving Northwest and North Central Ohio for over 10 years, Annunciation Radio is your home for the Bishop's Corner and other great local shows from our own diocese, like Say Yes to Life with Peter Range, Understanding Scripture with Father Dave Nuss, and our live local Catholic morning show, Morning Offering. Listen live on your radio or anytime on demand on the Annunciation Radio app or website. And we are back. Here, so pleased folks. you're back with us, folks. And folks, uh, we're here with Bishop Daniel Thomas. And of course, we are anxious to get your questions. Uh, you can submit them at the website or the mobile app we gave you earlier. You could also email the question directly to bishop at annunciationradio.com. Please give us your first name, parish, the town you're from, something like that, so the bishop has an idea who he's speaking with. Uh, if you don't hear it on the very first question you listen to, keep listening, because uh, you'll probably hear it on the next show. Bishop, we're going to go to Raymond in Mansfield. Jump right in, Raymond. Thank you so, for writing. Dear Bishop Thomas, unfortunately, I can't go into too much detail. Uh, what is the best way for me to pray for those who have significantly hurt me? I tend to live in the past, and it is hard for me to forget the pain I suffered. Does this mean that I have not truly forgiven them? And if not, then how do I take the necessary step to extend true forgiveness? Thanks, Raymond. Beautiful. Raymond, what a thoughtful question, and thank you for that. Very pastorally sensitive. I'm sure there's many people watching and listening who have felt this very thing. How do I forgive someone who's hurt me deeply? So I would humbly suggest, and I know you do it often, I'm sure, Raymond, and that is the Our Father. Don't we pray, every time we pray the Our Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I know that's what you're asking, isn't it? So now let's jump into the sources. Let's go to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, numbers 2842 to 2844, so that we can better understand how we can forgive. And it's those numbers I would suggest if you go to it, that's going to be a teaching that really does extend to you and help you, Raymond. How do I extend forgiveness? So, for example, 2844 says, Christian prayer extends the forgiveness of enemies, transfiguring the disciple by configuring to the master. 2843, and I know I'm going backwards, but I'm left-handed. The Lord's words on forgiveness, the love that loves to the end. So, imitating Jesus and 2842, as we forgive those who trespass against us, it says this as is not unique in Jesus' teaching because he goes on, you must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. But could I give you a personal note? There was someone who I was struggling to forgive and that person I felt had offended me deeply. And I never had the opportunity, Raymond, to say that to them in, in life. And I actually went to their funeral and kneeling at their casket, I asked the Lord to give me the grace that I could forgive that person now in my heart, even if I couldn't forgive them in life. And I received a great grace from the Lord and a cleansing, cleansing prayer that I was able then to say, Lord, I forgive them of any offense they ever made against me. So I believe that the Lord will assist you and I believe if we really desire it, then it will come. It may not necessarily mean that you're able to do it to the right to the living person, but eventually I believe the Lord will give you that forgiveness in your heart. Thank you, Raymond. Yeah, thank you, Bishop. Thanks for that question, Raymond. Uh, we're going to go to Karen in Perrysburg. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Perrysburg in the house. Dear Bishop, why are gluten-free hosts offered at Mass, and when did this begin? Thanks, Karen. 
So, Karen, thank you. And uh, you folks know, and Karen, I don't mean to be, you know, negative Nelly, but sometimes I have to correct the question. And I have to correct your question. Why, Karen? Because gluten-free hosts are not offered at Mass. Low-gluten hosts are offered at Mass. Because if they were gluten-free, they wouldn't be the Eucharist. There's got to be some gluten in the host in order for it actually to be, quote, bread that is the matter for the Eucharist. So we have to be really mindful. There is no such thing as a gluten-free host. There are such things as low-gluten hosts. Now, why do we have those in the church? A lot of people, we haven't heard about that for a long time, but now, and you can find on the USCC website, celiac disease is very, very much common in our, our world, and it's an immune disease reaction to eating gluten, a protein found in wheat, barley, and rye. And for those with the disease, eating gluten triggers an immune response to the small intestine. So low gluten hosts are offered to assist those people not to have that reaction. Now, please know that a person doesn't have to receive the host, the sacred host. The person who might be gluten intolerant can also simply receive the precious blood if they have no issue in that regard. So, and, and you might say, well, the precious blood is not offered at every Mass. Well, then the person should approach the preach, priest who will certainly accommodate the possibility of that. And I have to tell you, just at the National Eucharistic Congress, I was asked as bishop to assist in, in distributing the chalice while a bishop stood next to me with a pattern of low gluten hosts. And there was a huge sign that said low gluten hosts so that these thousands of people would know if someone had celiac disease, they could come forward and receive either the low gluten host or the precious blood, which you both, we all know, either under the form of bread or under the form of wine, the body and the blood of the Lord contain the full body, blood, soul, and divinity when we receive the Eucharist. So no such thing as no gluten, only low gluten, and it's for folks who suffer celiac disease. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, Samantha in Toledo, dear Bishop Thomas. Thank you, Samantha. I am having a hard time reading into the only unforgivable sin, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. How can someone do this, and how could we avoid it? Thanks, Samantha. Thank you, Samantha. And I have a confession to make. Get ready. All the years are now listening. People are watching. My confession, Samantha, is for years I struggled with that passage too. And for years, even in the seminary, I thought, what in the world is an unforgivable sin, right? And what's a sin against the Holy Spirit? I can share with you that the reality is, and we make the quote that you reference, of course, people should know is Mark 3, 28 to 29. And on the surface, it seems to clash with the mercy of Jesus, doesn't it? However, this really gets to the nitty gritty of what Jesus was saying God can forgive anything if we're sorry. So not surprisingly, this passage has sparked controversy constantly. And I think we have to ask, what does this passage from St. Saint Mark Gospel mean? It means the one who blasphemes against the Spirit is the one who refuses to accept God's forgiveness. That's the bottom line. Go to the sources. Catechism of the Catholic Church explains, number 1864, there are no limits to the mercy of God, but anyone who deliberately refuses to accept his mercy by repenting rejects the forgiveness of his sins and the salvation offered by the Holy Spirit. Such hardness of heart can lead to final impenitence and eternal loss. So blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, I believe and I would hope, is rather unusual and very, 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 very rare but it means someone who rejects the mercy of God. Hope that's helpful. All right. Thank you. Bishop. Thank you. Can we get one more, Yeah, Rob? let's get another oh, one word. in here. This is amazing, folks. <laughs> uh, we're going to go. Ron to... is astounded. Kathy we're getting all these questions. Sylvania. Dear Bishop Thomas, I understand what a diocese is, although I am unsure how a geographical area is determined. Can you explain this? Do churches ever change di diocese? And if so, who makes that decision? 
Thanks, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks for writing in from Sylvania. And this is it in a nutshell. So every diocese has a geographical area and distinction, which was determined by the Holy See, by the church. The geographical area is in consultation with the USCCB, that is, the Conference of Bishops, as it would be for us in the United States or in any other country. And the bishops of a given region where a new diocese may be erected are the ones who suggest this determination of the ge geographical area. One reason, for example, a motivating reason for the creation of a new diocese would be the growth of Catholics in that diocese. That is, it would be broken off. So, for example, churches may be impacted. A diocese may also be merged with another diocese if there are fewer Catholics. So churches, and I think when you say do churches ever change, I think the language better would be do parishes ever change. Would they be impacted when a new diocese is, is erected? Certainly they would be. Let's take our own diocese, for example. The Diocese of Toledo once belonged under the Diocese of Cleveland. So all the parishes of the Diocese of Toledo were once part of the Diocese of Cleveland until 1910 when the Holy Father erected the Diocese of Toledo, named its first bishop, Bishop Schrems, and the diocese was established as a geographic region separate from the then Diocese of Cleveland. Now, if a diocese is merged with another, then the parishes of that diocese are merged, and then they become part of the other diocese into which they're being subsumed. So it's a matter of the geographical area, it's determined by the Holy See, recommended by the bishops. And, it, you know, for us, our geographical region is 19 counties of Northwest Ohio. And we're in another area, which is known as a metropolitan region. That's all of the state of Ohio underneath the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. All right. Great, you, Bishop. You're welcome. And now we, we always learn something on this show, don't we? We have a minute or so before we need our. Break. Oh, that's you always dangerous, you folks. Have anything you want to when talk Ron about? gets a minute, no, he always poses you, these questions. Anything, you know, it's 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 the end of summer, and we're going back to kind of real life. Here. Well, I well I, I don't know, Rob. My life is always real. Well, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> I think we want to talk again about the Eucharistic revival okay. and the Eucharistic National Eucharistic Congress because. I don't think that we can underestimate the power uh, of the effects of this rippling out to our whole nation. You know, at the Congress, uh, Bishop Barron said, there are 70 million Catholics in the United States. And one of the things they they uh, recommended was, you know, go go out to one, one person. He said, if 70 million Catholics, if each of one of us you know, reignited a love for living out and understanding of the Eucharist. And if we each chose one person, just one person, maybe the member of our, a member of our family, somebody at work, somebody we know has fallen away from the Catholic faith, someone who's not Catholic but interested, if each of us chose one person to have coffee, have lunch with, chat with over a break, and invite them into the Eucharist, can you imagine imagine what that would do in the United States. So each one of us called to be Eucharistic ministers, that is going out as disciples and Eucharistic missionaries for the sake of Jesus himself in the Eucharist. All right. Thanks, Thank Bishop. you. Could we get a prayer and blessing? Sure. Let's pray our prayer from the Mass from the 20th Sunday of Ordinary Time, from which we took the Gospel. Let us pray. O oh God, who hath prepared for those who love you good things which no eye can see, fill our hearts, we pray, with the warmth of your love, so that loving you in all things and above all things, we may attain your promises which surpass every human desire. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Ron. Thank you to our viewers and listeners always, and so delighted that you're with us. Many blessings. See you again right here next week, folks, at the Bishop's Corner.